Hi, this is uh, E. David Crawford from the University of Colorado. Joining me today in Grand Rounds in Urology is our section editor for Next Generation Imaging, Dr. Phil Koo, uh, who is from Banner MD Anderson in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Phil has uh, really had a great career in the area of nuclear medicine and this whole topic of next generation imaging. There are a lot of new agents coming out right now that allow us to image prostate cancer and uh, also a sort of an offshoot of that are these new agents is sort of coupling it with something that's called Theranostics. It's relatively new. It's a hot area, yet uh, it's new in prostate cancer. This sort of treatment has been around for a long time, for instance, with radioactive iodine for thyroid cancer. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil. And, and again, thank you for being in Grand Rounds in Urology today. Phil? Great. Thank you very much, Dave. It's an honor to be here to talk about uh, this exciting topic. So yes, correct. My topic is Theranostics and Prostate Cancer. Um, and we're going to approach this from the nuclear medicine perspective because I think a lot of the exciting work currently, uh, there is a lot of exciting work occurring in nuclear medicine theranostics. So just to sort of level set, nuclear medicine uses radiopharmaceuticals that are injected. So we use uh, the body's systemic system to, to deliver various drugs uh, to different parts of the body. And we operate using what we call the tracer principle, which is a radioactive, biologically active substance uh, which is used in such a way that its spatial and temporal distribution in the body reflects a particular body function or metabolism. So by using a body's natural uh, body function uh, or whatnot, we could target some of these injectable radiopharmaceuticals to target certain processes. This isn't new. You know, th these are things that have been occurring on for, for decades. And as uh, Dave, you had mentioned, uh, iodine was one of the first uh, ones that we had used in the past. But I think what we've seen is a tremendous growth in the idea of nuclear medicine therapies. And the biggest advancement has been with radium-223 that is used in patients with advanced prostate cancer because it's not only is it an alpha particle, but it also leads to improved overall survival. So this is a game-changing drug, and I think this is, you know, radium-223 is a game-changing drug, and it really forces us to think about things differently. Similar to the way Michael Jordan changed the game of basketball, and now Steph Curry is changing uh, the way basketball is played. You know, I think these drugs and theranostics will change the way in which we practice for years to come. All right, so theranostics. Theranostics is a combination of therapeutics with a companion diagnostic agent. So the companion diagnostic agent will help us select the appropriate patients to undergo a certain therapy, and it will also help us identify those patients who are responding and those patients who are not. Obviously, if a patient is not responding, it doesn't make sense to move forward with a certain therapy. And if they are responding, you know, having confirmation of that will help us provide and tailor therapy for those patients. It's, this all works on this idea of identifying a target and then creating, whether it's a monoclonal antibody or a small molecule, to target that specific receptor or target. And if we could do that, then what we could do is we could attach a radioisotope to that binding molecule in order to either image the patient and it for, for it to be a diagnostic tool, or we could attach a radioisotope that has a therapeutic aspect to it that, so it could be a therapeutic tool. So again, we need, to, we need to identify a target and then we need to create those binding molecules and then from that point we could just alternate or just switch the radioisotope uh, to serve the purpose that we need it for. And this leads to personalized medicine. So if we have a large population of patients, obviously within that population, we want to identify those patients who express a certain target versus those who don't. And if a patient does express that target, then we could identify them and we will know beforehand whether or not they're the appropriate patient for that therapy. And if they don't express a target, then it makes no sense to move forward with a certain therapy. And that's how Theranostics and nuclear medicine can help with personalized medicine. So in prostate cancer, you know, we, we hear a lot about PSMA, and I think we're seeing a lot of advancements with regards to the diagnostic piece of PSMA. Gallium-68 PSMA, you know, has been shown to detect disease much sooner, 
and which much greater specificity than other agents in the past. And it's very specific for the PSMA receptor. So if we could identify patients who are expressing the PSMA receptor, what we could do is instead of putting a gallium-68 PSMA, we could put a lutetium-177 radioisotope that will then treat the patient. Lutetium-177 is a beta emitter and a gamma emitter and has a half-life of roughly seven days. That beta emission is what will allow uh, the, the lutetium-177 PSMA to treat and kill those prostate cancer cells. So this is uh, a nice image from uh, the journal Nuclear Medicine that was published in, in, in 2014. Basically, you had a patient who underwent a gallium-68 PSMA PET-CT scan. And what you see is various sites of disease in the bones and also in the soft tissues. And this confirms that the patient is expressing the PSMA receptor. All right. So this helps identify sites of disease, but it also confirms that this patient is a PSMA expressor. So if we confirm that and we know that, then we can move on. And instead of using a gallium-68 PSMA, we could attach a lutetium-177 PSMA and start treating the disease specifically in those areas that are expressing the PSMA. So using lutetium-177 PSMA, you see that the distribution of METs is similar from this image to this image because, again, it's just a matter of PSMA expression. But what's happening here in B is the lutetium-177 is emitting these beta emitters that is killing the cells. And we see here this patient's PSA was 387 for their first treatment. And then we treat this patient four times and you see that the distribution is the same, but the intensity of activity is going down over time. And you see the PSA go down over time when it's, and finally after four doses, it's at 1.08. So again, this is the idea of combining and being able to confirm that we are reaching the target and it is working. So from that same study, this uh, graphs the maximum PSA change in those patients. And you see a, 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 a significant decrease in PSA, PSA values in these patients who are undergoing therapy with lutetium-177 PSMA. In that cohort of patients, there were some patients where the PSA rose. But again, these are very early trials without the optimal dosing, timing, and whatnot. Um, so again, it's still early, too early to determine what the best course of treatment is. But the fact that we had a significant number of patients with the PSA response is very encouraging. There have been lots of single-site retrospective studies done all outside of the United States that have used lutetium-177 uh, for PSMA. And I was just at the RSNA annual meeting in Chicago, and, and there was another uh, set of patients, uh, multi-site from India, that, that published similar results with a positive response to these lutetium-177 uh, PSMA agents. This is a good example of how certain patients will be metabolically active with an FDG PET scan, but they won't show up on a PSMA uh, PET scan. And this confirms to us that this patient is not expressing that PSMA receptor, so it does not make sense to give this patient a lutetium-177 PSMA uh, radioisotope. So that's using lutetium-177 um, attached to PSMA. TAT stands for targeted alpha therapies. Targeted alpha therapies are, are sort of a new area, class of drugs, that have been really stimulated by radium-223, the use of, radio, of alpha particles to treat disease. So actinium and thorium are two different types of alpha therapies uh, with a half-life of 10 days and 19 days, respectively. The beauty of these alpha th particles is the fact that their relative mass is magnitudes higher than a beta particle. But more importantly, their range in tissue is much shorter than a beta particle. So you have an alpha particle, such as radium-223, that will hit disease with a, much, with a much higher energy level, but it does it in a much shorter range. So the amount of non-target radiation is much less, so you get less complications. And that's why we see radium-223 being uh, a very safe agent in, in, for the treatment of patients with prostate cancer. We're, and what we're seeing is that field evolving uh, for the use in PSMA as well. And this is a cartoon uh, that shows the idea of taking an antibody chelator conjugate. So this is the, what's going to bind to the target. You have a chelator, and then you attach an alpha particle to it and inject it into the venous system. It circulates, 
and ideally it localizes to the area that expresses the most amount of a certain target, in which in this case it would be PSMA, and that's how it treats disease. This comes from the journal Nuclear Medicine as well in 2015 that shows the use of alpha particles using actinium and seeing that response in patients. So this is a gallium-68 PSMA PET scan that shows disease throughout the bones and also the soft tissues. Um, so this patient, again, would be eligible to undergo a PSMA-directed therapy. In this case, it would be used with actinium-225. After three cycles, you see all those different sites of disease just go away. And their PSA just went from 2,900 down to 0.26. And this patient was given another dose for consolidation, and their PSA continued to go down less than 0.1. So this idea, this is very exciting, the use of an alpha particle to target these alpha particles to these prostate cancer cells and get this type of response. Again, it's very early to know how best to use this and what type of protocol and if it's safe, but, you know, I think this is very promising. You know, that's, I think, when it comes to alpha particles and PSMA, the idea of safety is going to be paramount, you know, because if these uh, radioisotopic gets to the salivary glands, it could cause a lot of uh, damage to the salivary glands and other organs as well. So it's something I think we're going to have to investigate further before this is ready for prime time. You know, I think the take-home point here is that this is not a fad, um, and I think it's here to stay. And the reason why I say that is Novartis um, recently purchased a rated pharmaceutical company uh, called Advanced Accelerator Applications for almost $4 billion. And this just occurred in the past uh, two months. And that was all based on uh, their product using dotatate. So this comes from the Netter 1 Phase 3 trials that use gallium-68 dotatate and lutetium-177 dotatate to treat patients with metastatic neuroendocrine GI tumors. And in that patient population, I believe there are 230-some patients in that study, they showed a median progression-free survival uh, of 8.4 months in patients who were just receiving octreotide to an estimated 40 months in patients who received the lutetium-177 dotatate with the octreotide. They actually didn't reach the progression-free survival, so this is sort of an extrapolation. But again, a significant improvement in progression-free survival. And they also saw almost 80% risk reduction in progression and survival in these patients. So again, based on this data, and this will likely be FDA-approved early 2018, uh, we're seeing a lot of excitement, and, and this is going to be uh, probably one of the first, the first uh, new theranostic, nuclear medicine theranostic to market um, with great, great results. Thank you. Yeah, that was an outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, it's sort of like a Star Wars thing. It's exciting. The, um, the fact that you uh, were now seeing those responses that you saw with Lutetia 177 in that patient whose PSA went from 300 with a lot of lesions down to very low level was impressive. Um, yeah, what, yeah, and I'm also excited about what you mentioned with alpha particles. Um, is there any difference in the toxicity that we're seeing? I know there's no comparative trials between the the beta and the alpha particle delivery system. So there, there are differences. I think alpha particles, if you could target them very specifically to a certain area, uh, they should be safer and they'll pack a more powerful punch, so they'll be more therapeutic. And that's what we see, we saw with Radium-223. Because Radium-223 was a calcium mimetic, it localized to the bones, and it did a great job at treating the bones. With PSMA, it's a little trickier, because PSMA is expressed in non-prostate cancer cells as well, kidneys, uh, vascular lining, you know, and whatnot. So some of this might get localized to non-prostate cancer cells. So if you get an uh, alpha particle that localizes to one of these areas and gives off its radiation, it could cause more significant damage to non-target cells than we would like. With lutetium-177 PSMA, it's going to localize to those same, same areas as well, but the amount of radiation it gives won't be to the level of alpha particles, so the amount of side effects you see should be less. So again, if we could target it better, we could treat it better, but with PSMA, we're not quite sure yet how we could target it only to those prostate cancer cells. Great. So, um, the when do you think 
that something like the Lutetia 177 beta particle is going to be available in clinical trials in the U.S.? So, great question. I think when it comes to, first we should talk about gallium-68 PSMA. So the great thing about the Novartis purchase of, of advanced accelerated op applications is they have a gallium-68 PSMA agent in the pipeline. So right now in the U.S., uh, there are multiple sites currently using gallium-68 under research protocols. So with the data ga gathered within these research protocols, we should hopefully see FDA approval of gallium-68 PSMA in the next, hopefully, two to three years. And then at that point, simultaneously, I, there's talks of more of these lutetium 177 PSMA trials being started in the U.S. as well. And I think UCSF is one site that is uh, very close to opening one of these trials. And again, if we start seeing some more data from this and, 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 and it grows, and I think hopefully maybe in the next five years we'll see approval uh, for, for a PSMA-directed theranostic therapy. Well, Phil, that's, that, that's really exciting. We're uh, excited to have you as a section editor for Next Generation Imaging and look forward to our, the monthly updates from you. Thanks, and I appreciate you joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Excited to be part of this new uh, adventure.